Inspired and driven by his values, John acts as a facilitator, coach, and guide for his clients as they test, discover, and expand what they can do. He uses concrete, verifiable processes to help them achieve demonstrable, solution-focused results. Remaining faithful to his passions and principles, John invests himself in his vocation without reservation. He provides spirit-filled, insightful guidance that his clients use to amplify their lives and their businesses. John truly provides leadership people can follow through storms. And I'm so excited. You're going to want to stick around for today's episode to hear our conversation. The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to Rat Race Reboot. I'm your host, Laura Noel. And as a certified coach and former 27-year military leader, Each week, I provide bite-sized mindset pivots that will help you reset your mind, reawaken your spirit, and regain your control. Hello, hello, and welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Rat Race Reboot. I'm really thrilled for this conversation we're about to have Uh, John Robertson, I just want to welcome you to our show. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Um, So welcome and thank you for being here. No, I want to thank you for allowing me to be a guest and I look forward to our conversations. I've been looking forward to it myself. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting because we were talking backstage in the green room about, you know, what would be impactful for today's discussion. And We had a lot of common threads and conversations and notices that were very similar. And I think it would be really helpful for all of you listeners to hear a different perspective, hear this from somebody else. You know, this is all about rat race reboot. The rat race isn't something you can win. (laughs) We got to kick that to the curb, right? And, And really get aligned and focused with the things that truly matter to us most. And how do we do that? in a post-COVID environment. So, um, but before we dive into all of that goodness, um, John, I'd love to hear about your journey and um, how you've gotten to where you are in your career right now. And, you know, what inspires you with that? There's kind of a convergence of things. So first of all, I was at the center of most of the crises storms in my family of origin. So I was one of those kids that, well, I haven't done that before, and then deal with the fallout. Then going to university to be a doctor, an MD, ending up becoming a clergy pastor, and then moving into kind of community-based approach to helping people get through their storms, their crises, whatever you want me to call it. But one of the things that I got really tired of was almost, and I'm not criticizing medical people, but the medical model that so many of us apply, wait till somebody gets injured or ill, then we treat. Rather than, and the visual I use with people is a battery. Why do we wait until our battery gets in the yellow or red before we do something? Why not focus on keeping the battery in the green so that when we get our psychological, emotional, physical, moral Charlie horse, and it puts us in the yellow, it's easier to get back to the green than it is to get from the red to the yellow to the green. And I got tired of the reactive model. And so, okay, John, there's two approaches, complain and whine about what's wrong or give an alternative. Hence, run toward the roar ethos. Ah, uh, I love that, and I I love that you're bringing up the reactive model that mm-hmm. so many of us ascribe to, and what we've learned. Right, we're just yeah. putting a band aid on things, <laughs> but we're not really getting to the root cause of some of our struggles. And it really, in essence, when we can get to that root cause, and when we can build ourselves up, we're much more resilient. Right. 
Yeah. And and just to jump off of that, if you stop and think about when do most of us look after things? If I have a marriage crisis, I wait until the marriage is in crisis rather than, okay, what am I going to do to keep my wife wanting to spend time with me? Now, that's not always going to be true. I'll confess that right out of the gate. But parenting. When do parents, and and in the workplace, it's the exact same thing. You know, people, children in the workplace are throwing sand rather than helping people play well together in the sandbox. Yeah, you know, that reminds me of um, something that I learned through reading Arbinger's work, um, the Arbinger Institute, and they talk about this influence pyramid and how mm -hmm. You know, we can sometimes the top of the pyramid is when we correct the bottom of the pyramid is making sure that our mindset is outward focused on people. But then it moves up to building relationships, to listening and learning, teaching and communicating and correcting would be the the tip of the, the pyramid where yeah. you want to spend most of your time at the bottom uh, helping things go right particularly when things are going right, building those relationships, building your relationship with yourself so that yeah. when you do have to correct or pivot or adjust um, or adjust something that you're doing, it's much more palatable, more than likely it will be better received too. Well, and, and you put your finger on one of the key themes, whether it be a person in crisis or a person stressed. And keep in mind that change can be a crisis for some people, hence the last few years. The, the words spoken are not always the words heard. And one of the themes that we have to be willing to address is communication is never what's said. It's always what's heard. And Laura, if you and I don't have a relationship, and I'm not going dark humor on that but if you and i don't have a relationship whatever i say gets filtered through the relationship lens yeah and uh, you know it could be like the teacher off of charlie brown <laughs> yeah the message is not coming through so true and i'm i'm thinking about even I was thinking about this too the other day of the idea of attitude and you could have two people deliver the same message to you mm -hmm. and one person is maybe providing feedback. Maybe it's constructive or negative feedback, but their, their energy behind it is they care about you yeah. and you're going to receive that message much more differently than somebody who has the same exact message, the same feedback but they're annoyed with you, not because, and that they want you to change, not because it's in your best interest. It's because they, they're tired of dealing with it, right? You're going to feel well, that. And what you put your finger on is part of the whole rat race is helping people understand the difference between discipline and punishment. And what mm -hmm. you just perfectly described is the difference. Punishment does not require a relationship. It requires a correction because, well, those aren't the rules, John. This is what you should be doing. Right. Discipline requires a relationship. Actually, discipline requires love. If I discipline, I correct because I know that in the long run, if I don't say something and help, I will regret what I saw happen in your life. And that premise applies to rat race. It, it requires who are those people in our lives who love us enough to see our battery creeping into the yellow, who love us enough to say, hey, John, you're, you're rowing on one side of the boat. Yeah. I don't know how you're going to get to where you think you want to go. Yeah. That, you know, to be able to see that in somebody and I mean, it's one thing to see it in ourselves and we're going to get into that. I want to talk more about finding that stride and and seeing that in ourselves, but it's quite another thing to notice it in somebody else and 
influence them or that behavior in a way that's coming from a place of care, concern, and love and not judgment. And and that's why the proactive approach is the only one that works. Yeah. Because if you and I have not established a relationship, uh, a spirit of authenticity, a spirit of commitment, of character, that what we are in the dark when nobody's watching, then it doesn't matter when things are off going off the rails. It's those pre moments that dictate the hearability when we're in hot water moments. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, this is so rich. And I, how, how can we bring this even in the context of what's going on now? I mean, we, we were having a great dialogue as well before we even came on camera about this idea of if you're seeing somebody kind of heading to burnout and you, and you're wanting to notice that in yourself, or you, you notice it in somebody else and you want to communicate it. Uh, but Things have shifted so much so quickly since the pandemic. And, yeah. you know, initially what I noticed in myself and in other colleagues, you know, it, there were a lot of people who, of course, were, uh, oh, my gosh, the sky is falling. What are we going to do? And then there were some yeah. people who were like, well, OK, yeah. I guess this is a blessing in disguise. I can see what's really important to me now. And um, this is my we kept hearing this is my new normal. Oh. And. Um, I'm going to create space for myself and, you know, reevaluate. I've worked with clients who are like, you know what, I'm going to use this time to think about how do I want to be what, what, as I'm moving forward in life? How do I want to serve? What do I get to shift? But there are some of us who, and in organizations who created this new normal, new ways of operating and communicating with one another that, I think contributes in a lot of ways to more burnout. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. For example, Laura, one of the simplest things is virtual meetings. Mm. If if I'm driving over to your office to meet you, with you, whatever, I've got an hour's drive time or half an hour drive time. So going over, got half an hour. Coming back, I got a half an hour. When we do virtual, most people don't put in those drive times. So we roll from you and I meeting to my next meeting. In fact, I've seen it where I, you know, people are doing the check the watch as we're having this conversation. It's like, you know what? 20 years from now, this will not matter to me. Why don't you go prepare for your next meeting and we'll talk another time. And the reason I've learned that is it's actually adding pressure to me if I see the other person merely tracking time oh, so yeah uh, i think the dr svensson was the person's name but he wrote a book on margins taking the same principle i call it drive time but taking the same principle of dry time between virtual meetings the second part of this is the physical <laughs> and i have one of those smart watches that'll actually say uh whatever get up for a walk or something and i will say not now not now and oh, it's guilty. like really <laughs> yeah and and so what am i and this is where what i call a huddle a values anchored huddle our community our encourageability group is so important because those are the people that will say, just curious, John, how many times did you hit not now on your watch today? And they don't. And the key of trust is asking questions to which we don't have answers. Versus that, what we call didactic teachings. I'm going to lecture you on what you need to know to stop. Yeah. And and so therefore, and it's dark humor. It came from a funeral home director, a friend of mine. And I'll never forget Mike's comment. John, don't ever forget. All a guy needs is six close personal friends. And I, uh, Mike, I'm not, and I didn't get it right away. And he said, John, if you're going cremation, you only need one. Oh, oh got God. it. And, and same principle. Yeah. So. When 
and I would encourage your listeners, look around. Who are your six? Who are the six in your life who love you enough to carry you from one place to this place, which is really just encouragement? And I'm not talking about death. I'm talking about life. If we're stuck in a rut here, who are those six people that we can call upon who will help us get back on track? That's so good and so important. Well, it's the world is not going to say, John is gone. What are we going to do? That's that's not my area of influence. Right. It's that little sphere where, like Archimedes principle, I can put my finger in the water and raise the water level while I'm here. Yeah. Um, I, I, these are, I think these are things that people can start to do right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm t- definitely guilty of jam packing my schedule with back to back to back to back zooms. And it feels exhausting at the end of the day. It, yeah. You know, even when we're driving, if we're alone in the car, we're alone with our thoughts, or we can just relax or listening to a podcast like Rat Race Reboot or uh, yeah, Rat- what, a, <laughs> what an idea. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, an audio book or just yeah. think, ideate. You have that space to do that. And we so often don't create that space. And I love that that physical part of it. I mean, I have my phone too. I have my watch that'll say stand. And I, I, I just, you know, whatever. And I, I don't, you know, and I use, you know, Pomodoro techniques and different things to uh, kind of get me in a deep focus and then a break, deep focus break. But you have to be really deliberate with those tools and understand that how your mind works and that the brain yeah. needs that, that, um, that break. But you also brought up another thing, and it's something that I've been talking about quite often, is the idea of mirror neurons Mm -hmm. in our brain. And so when we are, you know, going from back to back to back, and we're in our new norm, and we're in the rat race, and we're behaving in a certain way, it's contagious. (laughs) It's, you know, a social contagion. And before you know it, and it's happening very quickly at an unconscious level that we all kind of get into that mindset, into those habitual behaviors. So it's, um, it starts with you as the individual being aware. Mm-hmm. Ah, this is so and good. What you're describing, which is really, I mean, I can go back to childhood and there was an old cliche monkey see. Yeah. Monkey do. <laughs> so all that neuroscience is proving is what we already knew. Yeah. If and and therefore, I mean, I find it fascinating because some of the work that I end up getting into is the DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion mm-hmm. stuff. But one of the things that people forget, if I do not feel socially safe, the relationship and everything else won't matter. Yeah. And and one of the things that we have to do is give ourselves permission to say, is this the real John? And when we're stressed or in crisis or whatever you want me to call that, the part of the brain that allows us to be creative actually goes offline. Yeah. So if I'm rolling from meeting to meeting and my cortex is not firing, I lose my creativity, which means my humor would become more, I call it sarcastic, but it's not, it's worse than that. Mm-hmm. It becomes a critical sarcasm. And dark humor is fine when people feel safe. On the other hand, dark humor, and we've all been at those, you mentioned weddings when we were chatting. We've all been at those weddings where somebody stands up to give a toast and they start into it and it's like, ooh, you might want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stop. Yeah. yeah. Stop. No, don't do it. Right. And and yeah. what happens now in some of those cases is alcohol induced, but sometimes in the workplace, it's the exact same sign, signal, symptom. And we can react to the symptom, or we can say, okay, John, what are you doing to keep a charge in your battery so we don't have to deal with those symptoms? Mm, yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. And it's called speaking the truth in love. 
But one of the things that we have to be willing to do is who are those people that are saying, okay, John, I don't know what's going on. If you want to talk, I'm here. However, what I'm seeing, I call it the hot water tea bag effect. Mm -hmm. What I'm seeing leak out of you right now, not stuff that we would normally like to see. Yeah. A perfect illustration of this is I was called to a workplace and this woman who before COVID was just your textbook, if you Googled office administrator excellence, her picture should have come up. Yeah. And so they sent her home. She was in a school office. They sent her home, brought her back, sent her home, brought her back and so on and so forth. After the whatever years of doing that, she came back to work and she was not herself. She was very, what I would call snippy. It wasn't the words they used. Her jo- work was not excellent anymore. And through a friend, the principal called and said, John, would you be willing to meet with her? Something's going on and we can't deal with this. I said, I will meet with her on one condition. You sit in on the meeting, but I don't need you to say anything. Oh, okay. Now, what's your relationship with like with her before all that? Oh, we had a great time. We used to sit together and have a coffee. I said, awesome. I sat down with this woman with the principal sitting there, and I just said, listen, I'll call her Joan. But Joan, a couple of people are expressing their concern, and I am not meeting with you because there's a performance issue. I am meeting with you because people are concerned. Before COVID, this is what they loved about you. And I named all those qualities. Right now, they're seeing a, a snippiness or an edginess or whatever you want to call it, like your battery's too drained. What, what's going on? What, how do we connect those two? Yeah. She ended up sharing, well, during COVID, my father died. I was not allowed. We were not allowed to have a funeral. Of There was only three people allowed to meet together. My son, who's been in and out of the school setting because they've opened school, closed it, has been dealing with depression. In fact, he was suicide ideation. We couldn't get him help. My husband fell and broke his hip and his employer wants him terminated or on long-term disability. And I've got a pinched nerve in my neck. Mm. And I looked at the principal and I said, and is there anything else you need to know? Like it was one of those. Yeah. And the principal said, wow, Joan, I had no idea. And I literally, Laura, I got up and left because there was nothing else for me to do. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The power of connection and what happens when we kind of lose all that connection. Amen. And connection is determined by the recipient, not the giver. Yeah. You know, it's the old, I'm not feeling the love right now. And we have to define it in a way that works for them. Yeah, it's, we really have to see other people Mm -hmm. and get really curious about what their needs are, not what we think their needs are, but get curious and ask, even if it seems like a, a silly question or I should know this. You know, particularly when our work situations have changed and adjusted and literally been transformed, we don't really know unless we ask and we get curious. And um, what you put your finger on will often point and some of the listeners will say, I don't have the time to do this and I don't have the we don't have the money to do this and yada, yada, yada. Okay, let me reframe that exact same discussion. How much? Is this frustration costing you? Yes. Yep. What about that person who walks away from your workplace over non-work related issues? How much is that costing you? You know, business invest, whatever, five years of experience plus 20, 30, 40 K of training. They walk out the door over non-related issue, non-work related issues. How much is that costing you? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, billions of dollars, you know, we heard earlier on the great resignation and and the the 
amount of time and money and effort it takes to train new yep. people. So you're paying anyway, you're paying That's a right. cost, right? Yep. It's just, you know, <laughs> you want to pay less and have a wonderful work environment than invest in your people, invest that time and that care. Yep. Yeah. So true. Uh, and you know, so I, a, a line that I've used is comes back to that whole getting to know the person cared for people care for the organization. I love that. Yeah. No. That's, that's a great, a great tagline with a lot of power. And, well, and, and I can guarantee you, Laura, I'm not asking you to share. But think about a significant event in your life. Doesn't matter to me. It could be the death of somebody, a job loss, any number of things. And I bet you, and I'm not a gambling person, but I can bet you the people that you thought would be there evaporated <laughs> or the people that you didn't know cared came out of the woodwork. Absolutely. Yeah. I found that the people that I thought would be there, some of them would be the most critical and yeah. judgmental. <laughs> no, and, is, so yes. and guess what happens in the workplace? And yeah. it doesn't matter to me what what's going on. Like, for example, you see a dead animal on the way to work. That might have a psychological Charlie horse for some people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Welcome to the human species. Sucks to be normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we we don't know unless we ask and we're curious and Absolutely. You know, and and unless we adjust our behavior in a if we truly want to help somebody, you know, I I love Edgar Schein's book Helping and a lot of his uh work around the idea of helping and how we can often think we're helping and, and mm -hmm. Arbinger calls it being outwardly nice where we think we're helping somebody but we're actually not. So helping in a way that is helpful to the person you're trying to help. Yep. And we only know that if we ask. <laughs> well, and the guy, um, it's been adapted for workplace appreciation is the topic, the book. But it's love languages is mm -hmm. where Chapman, I think, is his last yes. name. Yeah. But but it was adapted for the workplace and it's showing appreciation or appreciation at work or something like that. But it's love languages at work. And and one of the things that many of us don't take the time to say and learn, how do you feel appreciated? I was raised in a strong Scottish home. Hugging was not a natural form of showing appreciation. Yeah. I've been in Middle Europe cultures, Croatian, uh, Greek, Italian, and holy smokes, handshake doesn't work. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not an option. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, going back to this idea of this new normal, I mean, this is our life mm -hmm. now, you know, and so we have to find ways and strategies to navigate in such a way that we're caring for ourselves and others and yeah. each other. And I love how you highlighted a few strategies anyway, for people to kind of get in a rhythm. And I was telling you earlier how, when I used to sing at weddings on the yeah. weekends, when I first started doing it, I was like, Oh, this is amazing. I'm going to eat this fancy food. Yes. I will have a piece of wedding cake. Yeah. I thank you very much. <laughs> but then over time I was singing on Saturday and Sunday. If it was a long weekend, I might be singing three times every weekend. I was at a wedding and then it became a habit of eating like yeah. this. And I'm like, okay, I, I had to stop myself and go, okay, yeah. this isn't a special occasion. This isn't, you know, some anomaly. Mm -hmm. This is my life. How can I navigate <laughs> yeah. and find strategies that support me? And yeah. the same is true now with the way that organizations are, have found themselves structuring and navigating yeah. um, through this environment, a VUCA environment, really. Um, what can we do now? This is our life. Yeah. You know, and, and, mm -hmm. and one of the things, Laura, that I want to build off of what you just said is rather than doing one more new program, one more new course, Reframe that discussion to say, okay, what does success mean in a VUCA time? Yep. Because we have to clarify what we're sailing towards. 
Because if we don't adjust, and I'm not a sailor, but if we don't adjust for winds and currents and all the other things that naval people do, we won't end up to what we thought we were sailing towards. Yeah. And let's be honest, there's actually two norths. There's magnetic north and there's true north. And if we don't differentiate and adjust our compass as we're sailing, it's 100% failure rate. So yeah. what does it mean to be successful in a VUCA norm? Yeah. Well, there's only one person that can answer that for you and I, and it's not everybody else. Right. What does it mean for us? to have an organization or culture where people want to work? What does it mean for us to have leadership that people want to trust? They're trustable, they're respectable, they're followable, even when they're not likable. Yeah. Ah, such great questions. And I 100% on board with the, the idea. And I always tell people, even if you want to, I, I want to take a time management course. I want to do this. Okay, great. What's your goal? What yeah. changes? Because no matter what you're doing, no matter what change you're implementing, you always have to have a goal around it. Otherwise, you're just going to be spinning in circles. You're just changing to change. And we're watch Groundhog Day if you want to know how effective <laughs> just a program is. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, this has been incredible. I'm so grateful for our, our time together. Um, we're about ready to close, but this time has gone by so fast. Is there anything that we haven't covered? Anything else that you want to share with our audience? And where can they find you? Uh, so a couple little pieces. First of all, the book that I've written describes this ethos. It's called Run Toward the Roar. Animal instinct, human instinct is fight, flight, freeze, appease. We normally run away from roars. So crisis, change, so forth. Please find those people in our your life who will encourage you to run toward the roar. The easiest way to connect with me is my the website is fortlog.co. So fort, safe place in the frontier. You got to know where you're going. A log is a journal to help others sail the sea because there's no point going there alone. Dot co, because I work with people, colleague, coach, collaborator, come alongside. I'm not kind of going to be doing it for anybody so john at fortlog.co or landing page fortlog.co forward slash the rat race reboot but fortlog.co forward slash rat race reboot or just shoot me an email and let's do that conversation but at the end of the day laura one of the things that i really encourage your listeners or challenge them is define your definition of success. What does it mean for you to finish well? And then look around. Who are the people you have around you right now who will help you finish well? And if they're not there, go recruit them. That is wonderful advice. And we'll make sure that we have all of your contact information, your website uh, awesome. with that Rat Race Reboot landing page as well. Um, reach out to John. I highly encourage you to do that. And again, thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you listening today, remember, everything is created twice, first in your mind, and then in physical form. And I want you to have a wonderful rest of your week. And I can't wait to see you again next week. Thank you so much. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.